It is Sunday, May 31st, and just getting my morning going. Um, I didn't sleep good last night. I don't think most of America slept good last night. I, I don't know. I just think this, this whole thing with black lives being put, put low, put not a priority. Um, it's not ever set well with me. Um, just briefly, like I have always been drawn to, to a person, to a human being. And I don't care your, your race, your sex, your color, your orientation, like, um, I don't know if I'm drawn to a person, I'm drawn to a person. And I love people, you know, I have my days and, um, you know, relationships are tricky and they can cause a lot of hurt, but, um, I, I don't know. I, I've always had friends who were minorities. I've always, um, gravitated towards um black people i i just you know i anybody really I, i've had all kinds of different friends and some of the best memories i had in college was just hanging out with all of the international athletes that my university had brought in just like i don't know just everyone together hanging out not caring about where they came from or the color of their skin or if they spoke English well or not. And it was just like some of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. Um, just like community in, I don't know, not one, not one culture, not one race. And it, it's just like opens the door for beautiful things to happen. And I think this current turmoil obviously it's not a good time for anybody to be going through anything or experiencing anything bad like it's it's just a way worse time for black people all like covid is affecting black people um by far and large uh economically you know majority of them are coming down with covid they're more susceptible um, it's just, it's not, it's not a good time. And then on top of it, you've got police brutality happening and it's just this police brutality has been and always will be until we fix it, a fruit of what we are doing to these people, how we are, um, marginalizing a group of people here in America. And it, it's a symptom. So let's talk about this. George Floyd was allegedly had a bad check or a fake bill or something, okay? <clears throat> First off, that means that he doesn't have the ability, potentially, allegedly, he doesn't have the ability to go to the store and buy something for himself or someone else in need. Or I don't know, maybe somebody sent him to the store he was making a run for somebody, you know, that sent him something bad. I, I don't know, but, like, if he or someone in that position has to, you know, make a fake bill, why do they have to make a fake bill? Because they're not given opportunities. They're not welcomed in different neighborhoods and communities. Um, you know, companies might hire one or two black people, but they're not seeking those jobs. And then, you know, black people have, you know, worked in predominantly white areas and they're maybe just sick and tired of playing chameleon and having to pander to white people and act a certain way. And like, as a woman, I know that I have to be a chameleon at times to fit in with um, my male cohorts in, in the setting I work in. Um, I don't know if chameleon is the right word. I mean, we all have different aspects of our personality and, and a wide variety of things that we like and that we're into, but um, black people have to constantly 
be a chameleon to fit in and it's not um it's not it's not good for for their psyche you can't spend 40 hours a week faking to be one person you know and then expect to be happy with your job your position like and and it has to come from from white people just accepting accepting black people i i've always been accepted by black people like in high school my friend invited me to her all black church and i got so many hugs when i walked in the door <laughs> and it was kind of like weirded out i was just i don't know into their family barbecues and you know and vice versa and i you know that's my experience but i know that's not everybody's experience and um you know, every time I'm welcomed by a black community, I just think, wow, like how big of a person they are to have overcome 400 years of slavery, oppression, everything in their family line, like their great grandmothers being slaves or their grandmothers being slaves and just every bit of adversity they've had to come through at the hands of white people. And then accepting me into their life with open arms. Like they're willing to put that aside, you know, for us. And what are we doing for them? Like, how are we reaching out to them? How are we pulling up our black brothers and sisters? Um, and Christians, like, if you call yourself a Christian and you're not upset, even before this, if you're not upset and uncomfortable over uh you know racial racial inequality and just all the social justice issues that are happening with our black brothers and sisters if you've not been upset i don't know like i don't know how to say this but <clears throat> you gotta check your heart because we gotta love god and love others we gotta love people and if you don't have the capacity in your heart to have at least sympathy or empathy for these people, you, you got to seek the Lord because something is not right there. Something is disconnected. I, uh, last spring, was really encouraged by one of my students who had like been up to Milwaukee and visited this Pentecostal church. And I just came back with just amazing testimony. And I was like, okay, but I'm going to this church. Next time I'm up in Milwaukee, because I've got family up there, I am going to this church. Um, and she was like, well, you know, it's all black. And I'm like, even better. Like, I live for that. I love it. I, I mean, black people do church in a way that, Oh man, white people can't even imagine tapping into like they gosh, I don't know. Blessed are the brokenhearted. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know all the answers, but when you go to a black church, like you feel the Holy Spirit is there. Like the the worship is genuine. The pastors are real. They don't beat around any bushes. They're not trying to to you know impress people they're trying to bring jesus to people and I, I don't know it's just a beautiful thing it always has been so anyways i uh tell my aunt and uncle that i'm going to this church in milwaukee when i go to visit them and uh, ask if they want to go and um you know they said send me the address and um so I sent them the address they sent it to my cousin my cousin was like hey, you know, this is a bad part of town. I work over there. Like, things get stolen all the time. You don't want to go there. And so my aunt was like, you're not going to this church because it's a bad neighborhood. You could, you know, get robbed or worse. You don't want to go to this neighborhood. It's all, I, I, <clears throat> I don't even want to go into the whole conversation, but it, it left me unsettled. And I'm just thinking the whole time, well, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I hate lying to my aunt and uncle, but I'm going to gonna go. So I go up to visit them, and 
they they were like visibly upset of the thought of me going to this particular neighborhood in Milwaukee and I I don't know I was like okay I'm gonna go to this other church downtown Milwaukee Bruce City because I've been wanting to go there and um and check it out so I was like I'll just <clears throat> I'll just go to this church you know don't worry in the back of my mind I'm like you know it's my aunt but what mama don't know won't hurt her you know if I go to this black church and you know who's gonna who's gonna know the difference so I'm not even really like sure at this point like what times and days are I just feel like the Holy Spirit is really drawing me to go there and now here I'm trying to appease my aunt and at least by saying I'm going to this Bruce City Church if I actually go there, I'm not technically lying. I'm just not saying the whole truth that I'm going to this Pentecostal Church of God on a um, bad part of Milwaukee. So I go to this Bruce City Church. I'm sitting in these pews, and it's a whole bunch of white people. No minorities. Um, maybe like 10 minutes in, I notice one black man up at the front. And I'm like, okay. So there's hope here. I remember we're downtown, we're like downtown Milwaukee. You know, multicultural Milwaukee, very diverse Milwaukee. And this church is all white. And I'm just like, man, this is, uh, this is crazy because I came up here to go to this black church and I'm at this like all white church. And I don't know, I just got into the worship. I, you know, I'm just connecting with the Holy Spirit and praising the Lord and I don't know, God's just beginning to speak to my heart and quiet my heart and uh, the pastor came up and he was like hey guys usually I start off with a joke or I start off with uh, I don't know something that would connect me to you to hear the sermon but today is not that day he's like today is a day that we're going to talk about racial inequality and the oppression of black people here in Milwaukee and like in my head I'm like well mic drop like there's a reason got like I got pushed to go in here like this is where my heart is and I want to hear what other white people have to say about it and what they're doing about it and so he went through he had this whole slide this whole presentation like a history lesson on Milwaukee and how diverse it is and yet like Anheuser-Busch and all the big factories downtown have like less than 1% African-American employees. And that is not representative of the community. And, and all the largest, you know, money makers and, and employers and businesses in Milwaukee are not hiring black people. They're not, and there are, they're not retaining them or, I don't know. I just think he, they're certainly not hiring them. And so black people in Milwaukee, like many major cities, are in all one neighborhood, you know, rarely ever being able to integrate into our capitalist economy with everyone else, having the same opportunities, the same pay, the same jobs. So what are they going to do? They're going to go um, – get a lesser job and then how are they going to pay the bills and the same bills the same rates that we have to pay then what are they going to do they're going to have to yeah maybe go sell some things that they copped or worse like what are they going to do to provide for their family so i'm listening to this talk and the pastor goes hey i don't want to say this all by myself i want to bring up my friend who he like baptized like a year or two before that and he brought up that one black man that was sitting in the front of the church. And he began to tell his story of growing up in, in Milwaukee. And he was like, the first time that I learned that I was lesser than anybody, I was like five or six years old. And he was like, I, I like to explore and walk around the neighborhood. And I learned that day when I was five or six that walking across this one particular bridge that nobody told me about that, uh, black people don't go on this bridge and he said that he was he got rocks thrown at him by white kids and he was beat up and he began to shrink from who he was he began to 
be cautious of where he went and how he acted. And um, a piece of him broke that day. And, and just like all his struggles, and he's only like maybe like upper 50s, like maybe 60 years old. And he is, is just talking about this life that he's had. And he stayed here and he's lived here because of family and everything else. But just being constantly oppressed, working hard, being nice, all the like doing the most just to keep getting held down, held back by this society. And my grandmother was born and raised and lived and died in Janesville. My dad was born and raised in Janesville. And during this talk, I learned that Janesville, Wisconsin is like the epicenter of the KKK. Like that's a KKK, the biggest hotspot in, in America. And I'm like, those are my roots. And yet, I grew up in a different way. My dad grew up loving people. My mom grew up loving people. Like I I was raised to see people for people. And you know, I I don't know, it's just it's just crazy to me like how how much people aren't raising their families to see people for people and I know it's happening out there but it's amazing to me that I came out of these roots and now my my grandparents weren't in the KKK you know but they had these mindsets that weren't right I know that you know but we have come out of that and I know a lot of families have come out of that and they see the damage they see they feel how sick it makes their stomach feel to hear things and to see people get treated in certain ways and they make a change and they, they don't abide by their, their family culture or their upbringing or their family's history. And I just sat there in this service and I just began to cry, like just like uncontrollable tears, just hearing this man's story, just taking it all in, just like, man, I, I could leave right now and go to this black church. Like, I've heard everything I need to hear. And the pastor at the end of the service, he was like, all right, now we're going to take communion, and my friend is going to help me serve this communion. And I want this whole church to come up and take this communion from my friend. And I'm still, like, just sobbing at this point. And all I think is I just need to give this man a hug and tell him how sorry I am. And, you know, I didn't do any of this stuff to him, but, like, white people did. I don't know, just the effect that anybody did. Like, I'm so sorry. And I'm getting emotional now because it's just, like, it goes on too much. And I went up to him, and no one else in the church had, like, got up, but I just couldn't even sit in my seat for hardly a second longer and I I went straight up to him and he went to hand me the communion wafer and I was like dude can I give you a hug he was like what he was like taken back and I was like can I just give you a hug and uh he was like sure so he turns around and puts the communion down and I just gave him a big hug and just crying and just not everywhere. And I'm just like, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say, but I'm just sorry. I'm really sorry. And I took the communion and I was just happy to see that like the whole church had like gotten out and down the aisle and, and gone to line up to take communion too. And I just, I got out of there and I'm like, I'm going to this Pentecostal church. And so I go over there and, um, you know, people are looking at me somewhat suspicious, suspiciously and, and no doubt, like, I get it. People have walls and they're like, why is this white lady in here? You know, like, I don't know. Could be a million things going through their mind and they have walls for a reason, you know, but they, no one asked me to leave. No one treated me poorly. Nobody said anything bad to me. 
um, I eventually just started talking to a couple ladies around me and made some, some fast friends with them. And I'd gotten there pretty early and um, just waiting for the service to start. And the service was like, again, everything I needed to hear, you know, it was like a word from God for me. Like anytime I get into the word or, or hear a message, like uh, the word is alive. So it's always going to be for us, you know, but um, it was just, it was, it was amazing. And I don't know, God just like put in my head this, this um, certain amount of money I was to give this church and it just was really strong. I was supposed to give this money to this church. And I, I was like, I can't do it because I have a joint account with my husband and my husband is not, you know, on board for donating any churches. Um, you know, and, and we were newly separated at the time. So there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it. So I'm just figuring out how do I get this money to them? And I'm praying to God, you know, how do I get this money to them? Well, I didn't give it to him that day, but I go to leave and, um, you know, one of the ladies I'd been talking to, she was like, Hey, do you know how to get out of here? And I was like, yeah, actually my phone's about to die, but I can figure it out. She was like, Oh, well, you definitely don't want to turn that way. It's a bad part of town. You don't want to go there. Okay. So my aunt, my white aunt is telling me, don't go to this part of town. It's not safe for you. And now this black lady in the church is concerned for me in the same way. Don't go here. It's not safe for you. And she's like, you need to just take a right and just go straight. Don't stop. Take the second exit onto the highway and that'll get you back to where you need to go. And, you know, I, it's just lack of opportunity that is driving people into this cycle that is going to be really hard to get out of. And, the only way we get them out is to help them out and not give handouts, you know, but to, to generally like how we help people is to check our hearts, see what's in our heart. That's ugly. That's not accepting of people. That's not willing to try. That's not willing to be in uncomfortable situations or different situations. And we need to go out and, and reach out and help people. And I don't know. I just, I left that church with a big smile on my face. Um, happy to have, you know, met the people I did, just happy with what God had showed me and taught me that day and um, just like how to go forward. And so I, I leave the church, I go home. Um, next week I'm taking an athlete to a doctor's appointment and the bill comes up. $200. She's like, I can't pay it. I don't have that, that kind of money. I didn't think this was going to be that much. And I just immediately was like, Hey, $200, swipe my card. You can pay me back later. Didn't think twice about it. This is the same kid that told me about this church. Originally <clears throat> this Pentecostal church of God in Milwaukee. So I don't know. I, you know, the money comes back, it comes back. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It, you know, I don't have any kids. I have bills and stuff, but, you know, my athletes are like my kids. So I just want to make sure they're taken care of. And um, so she's like, hey, I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. Well, th the number that came into my head in that church service was $200. I like, give them $200. And now here I am. I can justify this like medical bill payment because it could have possibly been for me if my husband were to, to check me on it you know and um <clears throat> so the thought came in my head well you know this girl wants to pay me back and I'm like you don't need to pay me back you know but if you want to like let me tell you God told me to give this church $200 and now your bill is $200 so if you're gonna pay me back just give it to this church you know and she was like yeah definitely I'm all on board for that that's what we're going to do. So, you know, when her and her mom had the money for it, they just gave it to the, to the church. And, um, I don't know, it's just a really cool thing. I just say like, that's how like God laundered my money for me and made a way for me to, to, um, help out, um, what he'd put on my heart to help out, you know, despite my, my fears and my apprehensions and this the whole situation. 
but yeah, it just saddens me that just right up north from me, I'm in Chicago now, you know, my family's in Milwaukee, like, I see the segregation, I, you know, that's what it is, it's still segregation, like, we don't have signs and everything, but, like, we're not letting people in, you know, we're not reaching out, we're not putting ourselves in potentially dangerous situations, because we're scared we're gonna get mugged and, or, or hurt, or, rob or we don't want to park our car in a certain neighborhood every day because we don't want things to get stolen like that may be the case that may be the case for a long time but if we don't start putting ourselves in their shoes and reaching out to their communities and working with them and connecting with them and being a bridge and showing people your heart not just it's not enough just to say that you're anti-racist or you're not racist it's not enough like we gotta act and you gotta you know if you're in a position if you're a white person and you're in a position to hire people and and i said this before several times and i'll say it again like working with multicultural in a multicultural setting is a game changer it is amazing to experience and I, I don't even have the words for it but it's so good and if you as a white person have the power to be hiring people I know that we have equal opportunity employment you know we say all these things we have all this legal jargon but what are you doing to seek a different type of applicant like just had to stop for a second to get my dog, but um, yeah, if, you, if you're in a position to hire, to mentor, to lift up anybody in the black community, to give them an opportunity, do it like today, yesterday, do it more. If you're already doing it, do it more. Um, you know, I, I just I just have gotten this vision in my head for the last, gosh, I don't know, seven years of just bridging communities. Because when you experience people that are outside of your normal sphere, the people that you are in your family, your culture, and you experience these other people, you get to see them as a human being. And I'm not just like talking about like you work with this one person one time. So now you all of a sudden you're like an expert on their culture. No, like you have a relationship. You build a community with different people and you will see them as human beings. Like you will feel a different way, you know, about them. You will get to see something beautiful that you weren't taught, that you haven't been seeing when you experience it, when you're elbows deep in it, when you're in a different community, like it's going to impact you. And that's what we need. Like we need reconciliation. We need both parties in this racial reconciliation to be made whole. And we as white people need to let others into our community, into our workplace. And we need to go to others' community and, and just to see how accepting they are. And, you know, even when they're not, like, to be understanding that they've been hurt, they've been burnt, they've been told, you know, like, for example, I had worked at um, uh, pretty much all black children's summer camp. Um, in college and I was like one of two white people that worked there and I'm out here like day one well, being told to lead the kids in a game of basketball because I played ball and so I'm organizing the game of knockout with the kids and I'm trying to get their attention and I honestly like I'm, I never considered myself good with kids in the first place but I didn't by no means say anything bad to these kids I'm just like all right kids listen up let's line up let's you know we're gonna play a game like quiet down I don't know and this little black boy is like excuse me miss racist and I said I was shocked and I'm not not very outspoken 
it certainly wasn't Ben. And I was like, what did you just say? And I'm like, half hoping that he didn't actually say that. And he was like, oh, I mean, uh, I said Miss Wallen. I said Miss Wallen. I didn't say Miss Racist. And I'm just like, man, this little, like, 10-year-old kid just, like, why did he say that? You know, me just being, like, naive. And, and I am like, like, what did I do that made him feel that way? And I don't, you know, I don't think that I did anything to make him feel that way. And it just, like, broke me in a certain way. And so I just started to extend myself to that kid, like, this kid's going to know that I'm not racist. He's going to know that I'm here for him. In this camp and this time and whatever it is and uh we became buddies and then like going out on field trips like he wanted to come sit by me going to the lunch table he wanted to come sit by me and talk to me and, and in talking to him I asked him like hey that one day you called me Miss Racist why did you call me that and he told me that his family has been telling him, and now this is a 10 year old boy and this was like 10 years ago, not that long ago. And his family had raised him to believe that white people want to enslave black people again and that you shouldn't trust white people and that their only intention is bad for them. And you can't blame that. At the same time, it was eye opening for me as a white person because I thought, oh, we're past that. Let's just go forward, you know? We're past that, but we're not past that. And we weren't past that then. Now it's 10 years ago. And the progress we made, I don't know. I, I don't know if families are still talking about this to their kids. I know that families have to tell their kids that, you know, people are going to look at you different because of your skin color. And you have to act a certain way or else something bad could happen to you. I know that that is being said, but just the fact that families are saying that we want to enslave them again, like, it's like, man, no, I'm, any of my circles, I've never heard that, never heard that. It's probably out there. I don't know. It's probably out there. I've never heard it. And um, I hope I never hear it. But um, there was a bridge made that day. There was some understanding made that day. And I'm like, how can you not be changed by those situations? I could just been like, I don't know, that's, I'm out. Like these kids just hate white people. And so I'm just going to step back. No, like I just kept pressing into the uncomfortable situations. Um, and, and just kept building relationship. And, and then also that summer, like one of my, co-workers at the camp she had two little kids single mother we were out protesting um because they were about to drop uh funding for child care and for summer camps in illinois so we were down in springfield protesting all day and um this lady she had uh, like a black weave on and a black hat and um you know just out in the sun all day and I was like a freshman in the athletic training program, so I knew a bit, a little bit about heat, heat illness. Um, but yeah, I didn't recognize her as having any problems while we were there. We get on the bus, and there's like no air conditioning on the bus on the way back. So we pull off, and they're like, hey, Tanisha's sick. She's like not doing good. And um, I see her like eyes are rolling in the back of her head, and she's just like incoherent, like man so I'm helping her to get off the bus mind you this woman is let me just say like I was pretty scrawny she was bigger than me right I'm, I'm helping her get off the bus no one else is exactly helping at this point but I'm like we got to get her off the bus she's hot we need to cool her down and she's like barely with it and we're going down the stairs and she like kind of stumbles and I'm just like holding on to her and I get her under a tree and um you know, we're at this, like, park, and there's no, like, ice, there's, like, water fountain thing, it was, like, some truck park restaurant, rest stop thing, and I don't know, some, some other white guy from the military came by, and was, like, hey, you know, you gotta put, uh, cold water on her wrists, because 
you know, and I hadn't heard that before. It was a military trick because it's closer to the skin to cool her down. The other camp counselors, like, we got to take her weave off. We got to cut it out. It's like you could see steam coming off of her head. Like, she was in a full-on heat stroke, like, body temperature off the charts, dangerous situation. So we call an ambulance, and um, her kids are there see, witnessing all this, getting scared. You know, we call an ambulance, and nobody wants to go with her. And I'm like, of course, I'll go with her. Uh, so I took the ambulance to the Springfield Hospital with her, and she didn't have any other family in the area to come be with her. And so I'm here in this ambulance with her, watching this lady, like, on the brink of death, and the ambulance workers are like trying to ask her all these questions but she's incoherent and I'm like she's having a heat stroke like we got to cool her down and they proceeded to not cool her down and they didn't know what they're doing they're like just stay up front don't say anything and I was so like sick in this situation like I don't know call it incompetence of people or I don't know I don't I just don't know but they decided at one point that they couldn't handle the situation. So they pulled off the road. They waited for a paramedic team. So there was some EM, basic EMT team. They waited for a paramedic team to come and take over. So the paramedic team comes and takes over. We get to the hospital. She's still like on the brink and nobody's helping us. We're in this waiting room for like an hour and nobody's helping her. And, and it's dire to get body temperature cooled. And I'm, you know, the year after that I'm learning you know more of the importance of that like you before you even transport you got to get them cooled off but you know depending where you're at you don't have the ability to do that sometimes and so I don't know I, I stay there they, they take her back I have no clue what's going on I'm trying to contact the directors at this camp and um, keep them updated and like try to figure out like how am I gonna get back home and um, what's this lady's kids going to do, you know, and, and she'd like put me as her emergency contact. And so the hospital is calling me. So a couple from the camp came down to get me and, and brought me back while she was like having uh, procedures done to save her life. And the next day I'm getting a call that she just had a code blue. Like she stopped breathing and, um, do we continue life support? They're asking me this, this like 20 year old kid. And just like that, she just didn't have the family support. She didn't have like a man and her father to stick around for her kids, nobody. And they're calling me and I'm like, yes, of course, of course, you know, do what you have to do to keep her alive. And, um, you know, I know there was others praying for her and others there for her and, um, they did keep her alive. And then like, on top of that, I'm like playing social worker because I, I don't know the system. I don't know who you're supposed to call. I certainly obviously don't want any families pr broken up over this situation and like trying to make sure her kids are in a safe place. They got food, they got somewhere to stay and they did for a time. And, um, while their mom recovered and it was just tough and, you know, when she, she came back, she made it, um, found out that she tore her ACL after all this, like getting off the, the bus there, like going down the stairs and she kind of like tripped. She probably tore her ACL there and just like, didn't even feel it. Didn't even like scream out in pain or anything. She's so out of it, <clears throat> just overheating and her, her body was going out of control because it was so overheated. Like your organs start to shut down, your brain starts to shut down, like your body is shutting off. And it doesn't know how to get back to, to like homeostasis. It doesn't know how to get back to that. So I don't know. It it was uh, it was tough. Like I knew that she wasn't get being given the best care. And now I've seen, you know, EMT workers not give the best care. You know, in terms of like heat illness and cardiac issues and stuff like that. I've I've seen across the board people not be given the best care. But the thing that was bad is when, when she came back to camp, her kids were back at camp before she was. Um, but her kids, her son was saying, I'm going to go to the hospital and blow it up because they almost killed my mom. 
and you know like sitting with that kid and trying to explain to him that that's not what your mom would want you to do that's not you know like that's not what God would want you to do and like I know that you're hurt right now and you know but your mom's gonna make it like God's got your mom like I don't know it's just like a real situation (laughs) and thank God she made it and she's doing really well now and actually like ran into her youngest daughter um, last year accidentally at at a basketball game and ran into her and she's like oh my gosh it's my angel and like I'm, I'm no angel I'm just human doing the best I know how to help other humans like you just you don't leave people that need help you don't if you know how to help, you don't not render help. Like you, police killing black people is just, like you don't do that. They're trained better. They know how to save people's lives. They know first aid, you know, they've probably done CPR on people. They know when someone's not breathing, when someone's in trouble. Like this stuff is just senseless and it's crazy. And it's like I said, it's just like the fruit of what is going on. And we just need to get to the root of it and, and just love one another and put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and advocate and press in and just do, like, just be a better person. Like, I'm an athletic trainer, and we have this annual great lakes athletic training meeting and a couple years ago i'm sitting in this meeting we're taking a 50th anniversary picture and i'm looking around and like there's not two colored people in here this this is a white party this is a whole convention center full of white people and now we're sitting here taking a picture and i'm so uncomfortable with this it's too many white people in here like this is 2017 or whenever it was this is like this is not this is not cool. Like, this is my profession. This is not representative of the area. Like, why aren't there black athletic trainers here? Why aren't there Spanish athletic trainers here? What, you know, like, I don't know. It's just really uncomfortable. I don't understand when ever want to come back. But that uncomfortableness drove me to, to mentor my kids and my student athletes more to become athletic trainers and to, give them opportunities and chances and even even drag them along if they showed any interest and and I'm not saying you know in some situations you want people to be self-motivated you want them to like have this drive and this passion but I'm like no like any interest you're coming with me you're learning let's start a club let's do whatever and you know if maybe a uh, club leader would say hey we don't you know, we don't want to mess with these kids. They're not really interested. They're not really putting any work. I'm like, no, like, we need you here. You need to be a piece of this picture, this puzzle. Like, you are what's missing. Like, here's this opportunity for you, and I'm going to give you more chances and get you what you need, and how can we figure it out? And it's been a struggle. Like, there's been a lot <laughs> a lot of work on my shoulders and trying to get this done and 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 I it didn't look like how it was supposed to look this year in my mind I, I envisioned like all the kids that were interested in going to Glada with me and only one kid was able to go and um you know there's economic stuff with it there's family stuff with it uh, as to why these these kids couldn't go there you know they feel ill-equipped to go you know there's just so much to it but um, that doesn't stop me from one day seeing that vision come to full. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I've said this before and I'll say it again, like working in all white settings, being in all white rooms, it makes me very uncomfortable. Like, it's not like, like, why is it like this? I'm sure other people are uncomfortable with that too. And, and I know there's other organizations where it's all white. And what can, what can we do today, not tomorrow, not next week, but what can we do today to see the change that we need? How can we 
do all this? Well, it starts with a conversation like that pastor, like God just really told him, spoke to him, no, we're getting into this segregation thing here in Milwaukee. And he has been with this uncomfortableness. I'm uncomfortable at my church being predominantly white. Um, I've always been uncomfortable with that. I felt like God called me to this church, but it is predominantly white. And the reasons why, who knows, but I do know that it's spiritual warfare. So if you're a Christian too, I mean, it's doing, it's giving opportunities, but it's prayer. It's a lot of prayer. It's asking God to guide you to change your heart, to, to bind whatever principalities that are separating people, to change hearts is, it's warfare. And it's, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. Like you can just keep going on and doing you and, oh, you're, you know, you're a white male that got good grades and had all these opportunities. Let's see how far you can take it. Let's see how rich you can get. Let's see how good you can do. But who are you stepping on to get up there? And who are you excluding to get to where you're going? Who, like, what's the purpose? Like, you have all this money, but you, you know, when you're 80, 90, you're going to look back and like, this, you know, 60 years later, gonna we're going to be in the same boat of inequality and segregation and economic um, challenges that we have and and you didn't do anything to help that you can say what you want to say about people being violent about people looting and robbing and and all that and and black people don't like the looting and robbing and white people don't like the, the looting and robbing well but we understand it at the same time. Sensible people, like, we understand it. Like, you, you can't, you're not living the life that the rest of us are living here. Like, you don't go to bed the same way the rest of us get to go to bed. Like, at ease and at peace when stuff is happening to you and your family on, on a daily, weekly, yearly basis, whatever it is, however few and far between, like, that doesn't even happen to some of us like ever and I've been um abused by police and I won't get into it now this one time and I didn't die and I had you know some scars from that but it is what it is and I I get to go on about my life you know so I'm just asking white people, especially Christians, to just check your heart and just get in the battle and just love our black brothers and sisters more. Like, if you're, you're already doing it, do it more. If you're already reaching out, reach out more. If you're already hiring black people, hire more. Like, it's going to take a lot of us to get to that mentality for reconciliation to happen for change to happen and i don't know who's going to jump on board you know i don't know what's going to happen i know that there's going to be good change coming out of all this like why did it take so much to to get to where we're at now but just assume that no one else is going to be doing this you know like take responsibility um take chances on people on relationships people are cold to you up front if they're mean to you if they're rude to you pray about it and see how you can love them more and get over that difference that you had see what how you can be a better person see how you can bridge that relationship that gap um and just keep stepping out and keep encouraging and keep promoting and keep mentoring um, and giving opportunities so long as you're, as you're able to. And um, yeah, you know, it's kind of been all over the place, but I just wanted to get my thoughts out there. It's been, um, it's been a whole lifetime of, of action and thoughts and feelings for me and I'm sure it is for everybody else but we're not talking about it and it's time to talk about it it's time to get real it's time to talk about it pray about it be about it do it um you know and 
just staying silent is is it's not gonna change anything not hating people you know from afar it's not gonna change anything being nice to people is not gonna change anything like, you gotta do it so that's all I wanted to say um, yeah just, just pray for our country just pray for pray for healing today